Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Bede, and this is a series on Swami Dayananda's psychology. Now, if this is the first of the series that you have looked at, uh, it would be very good if you go back to the first one because it builds up slowly one upon the other because I want to create a sort of a sequence of understanding where we don't miss a single step. So, so but for all you other people, Welcome to this uh, conversation I'm having with Joe. Hi, how are you going, Joe? Hi, Bede. Good, thanks. How are you? Good. Now, I just want to continue on uh, talking about cravings or, or things that we love or experiences that we desperately want to have for the reason being that What we actually love, what we are drawn to, what we're moved towards is the organizing principle of our entire life. And I want to just show how that's the case. And the thing is that the thing that Dayananda unfolded was that what we value is primary. It is the primary determining, organizing principle of our life. So let's say, for example, um, I want to be bigger and better than others. A common experience, particularly when we feel inferior, when we feel deficient, it's a very juicy thing to experience ourselves as non-deficient and quite marvelous and outstanding and better than other people. So this desire for power or status is extremely, um, you could even say it's addictive, but the problem is it governs us. And I want to just go over how it does, but I want to just look at it that this is a value. We value this experience of being better and bigger and more important than others, having more status or stature. Okay, so nothing, this is very similar. We see it in the, the pecking order in with the chooks, don't we? Okay, it's very similar. But amongst human beings, it is. So, and as we said before, the person who's struggling or moving towards uh, a certain superiority, being bigger, better, and, and best, in relation to other people through comparative thinking, this is the basis of comparative thinking, won't actually, to the degree that they can actually successfully achieve that value, they won't experience the underlying pain and suffering of inferiority that that, um, that the whole striving is designed to get rid of. So, Pete, um, when you talk about values, <clears throat> does that include uh, what I desire, what I crave, what I pursue? Yeah. What I want to do is when, when, we, when we look at desires, we, we can... We can get away from the from the concrete particular, but what when we're desiring something, we are wanting to have an experience of a certain kind. That's what we're going for, and we value having that experience. Yeah. And, and so because, and and let's face it, there are what you would call life enhancing values, and the and and there's also life destroying values. For example. Being bigger and better than other people is actually a life-destroying value. You could say that it's it's not really valid as a as a, a value. However, I might have, for example, honesty as a value. And so therefore, because of that, that will also, if it's if it's actually valuable to me, if, if the value of honesty is valuable to me. It's my value and it will move me. 
The thing about values is values are what move us. So, for example, if we want love and approval, if we value love and approval, and we and, and if we don't get it, we feel deficient. So we have a, a value for love and approval. But we don't actually value love and approval. In this moment right here with this person, I want to be approved of. When I step back a little bit and I go, well, yeah, okay, I've got I value love and approval. Well, whoop did he do he done? The real test is here I am in the concrete particular of my life. I'm in front of certain people. And if that value, that's a defense against feeling sort of maybe isolated or no good or anything like that, right? If I have that experience of having love and approval, which will make me feel like I'm sort of okay as a person, then that's going to determine everything that happens. It's going to determine my way of being in the world. It's actually going to, now this is the important thing, the value that is active in me at this moment will determine how I think, how I feel, my physiological reactions, and my conduct. So when we talk about value, um, this is uh, in our Western philosophy, there's a, there's a guy called uh, Schopenhauer who, who I quite like, but he's considered rather pessimistic. But he made a distinction between the will and thinking. So when we're talking about values, we're not talking about thinking. Okay, we're talking about a movement of our heart towards having certain types of experiences. So it's a, it, so we we become when we, we literally we are being the value and operation at any one moment. We are being what we're valuing at any one moment. That is what we are being. In other words, uh, we we don't just have a value. When we have that craving, that wanting, going under even so, so primary, he used to go, I want, I want, I want, I want. He, he thought that that was like the background playing in our life. Yeah. Okay, so let's just. So you're saying okay, our, our thoughts are um, driven by that. We, probably the better word would be that's true. The better word would be governed. Governed, okay, governed, yeah. Governed, determined. You see, so what happens is, let's just say we'll take that very common thing of where we want to feel appreciated and liked. And if we're getting the message from other people that we're not appreciated, like we don't feel very happy about it, right? So let's just have a look at that. So I, I approach you and, and I say, hi, how are you going, Joe? Nice to see you. And you give me a kind of a, a, a rejecting smirk like this, right? Now, what's going to happen is what's moving me towards you and even making me want to talk to you is this value that I want, to, I want to get something from you. In other words, I want to get a certain experience from you. This has nothing to do with love, by the way, even though we call it love and approval, right? Some psychologists say we need love and approval. Yeah, right. We're going to, we're going to get rid of that one. Um, but so what happens is, you act in some way that is rejecting or uh, giving me disapproval. And suddenly I'm feeling disapproved of, right? Now, I might even... so. And the thing is, just to show you the compulsiveness of human life, when we feel that rejection and it's heavy, it shows you the degree of fear of that we have about getting anywhere near our self-dissatisfaction that we were talking about in the last talks. We find it so frightening, we get desperate if we're not being able to satisfy it. So so with that example of yeah. self-dissatisfaction, do you mean that uh, I will not like myself if I don't achieve the thing that I'm craving, like the approval of the other person? Yes, yeah, so I'm using the external event in order to, to feel at home with myself. It never works, by the way, but that's the effort. 
I want to feel. <laughs> I want to feel right. I want to feel right and fulfilled in myself, which is a worthy goal, by the way, right? So mm. I'm not saying it's not a worthy goal. It's just a question of, you know, Dianander says that human life is seeking to find happiness where it's not. Yeah. Okay. So and he called that samsara, as we mentioned last time. So. Here I am, you give me a smirk, you reject me in some way, or you give me some indication that I'm not approved of. Straight away, my, my thinking will be determined by that value. Now, be governed by that value. I'll be going, Joe's just a jerk. He's just, you know, he's one of those horrible people that I can't stand. So, uh, so in terms of, in terms of uh, my thinking, do you see how, my thinking is totally governed by that value. Yes, yes, that's right. Clear. It serves it. Mm -hmm. So, so my very cognizing doesn't just happen at any one moment. If I'm cognizing, it is a function of some value that's active in me. Whether that value is valid or not, or, or life enhancing or not, or real and true or not, or false and untrue is not the issue at the moment. All I'm saying is, is that the very fact that I am valuing, look at the, look at the verb, valuing, it's not just sit, it doesn't sit in us, it's, it's active in us, it's moving us, it's moving me. And so what happens also, so that that very thinking that, my very cognition of you, as far as I'm concerned, I'm just seeing you as a jerk. I'm not aware that I'm being determined by this value of being loved and approved of. So I'm not even aware that that's happening necessarily. I'm just aware that Joe's a jerk. Right? Now, yeah. in terms of feelings, what's going to happen? Maybe hostility or maybe intimidation. Do you know what I mean? So what happens is, you might reject me and then suddenly I feel very crawly. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Joe, if I've offended you. Like, you know, so I, what I'm doing is I'm propitiating. The word is propitiating. I'm propitiating. Like, you know, in the old days, some, some tribes used to propitiate to the gods, make sacrifices to buy the god. So what happens is we can suddenly find ourselves being propitiative. It's, it's like, oh, you know, basically that feeling of being a crawler, right? Or I might be... Yeah. I might be intimidated. If I'm intimidated, then I'm going to withdraw back. What's going to happen is there'll be feelings, and feelings drive us. Agreed? Yes. Then I'll I want to pull back. I'll, I want to. I, I I don't I don't I I, I don't want to get near Joe because Joe uh, it makes me very unhappy. Joe, in fact, doesn't make me unhappy. He's just very. He's an instrumental in revealing this. This self-dissatisfaction, in this case, a feeling of very inadequate and not a very nice person. And because I feel inadequate and not very nice person, feeling adequate and a very nice person becomes very important. But I'm not necessarily aware that I'm that I'm being moved by that. So does that mean that that kind of value contains its opposite in some way, in an unconscious way? Oh, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, it's a right. defense against the self-dissatisfaction. Yeah. Don Under right. used the word self-hatred. He says we can't stand ourselves. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so you see how my cognition is being affected? My feelings that, are, that that I'm having is being affected. Now, also my physiology. I, you know, I came into the room thinking Joe likes me, and suddenly, uh, I can actually my body starts to collapse a little bit. My breathing becomes actually shallow because I'm anxious. It's not smooth. So, my whole physiology is actually uh, also a function of this value that's active in me right here, right now, as I am. Because I can only see this. What Swami Dayananda wants us to do is examine our life. Our life is the concrete particular that we're facing right here. 
We don't want to go into spiritual la la land. All right. Yeah. So my physiology and then my conduct, like I said before, I want I might want to move back or move away. Right? Or I might want to attack. What's your problem, Joe? Right? So again, I, I can become intimidated, I can become provoked, or I can try even harder. I want more, try and get the approval again. Oh, Joe, I'm sorry if I offended you. You know, I, I didn't mean to. I'm, I'm, you know, so do, do you see what I mean? So because I'm very seduced, but I'm either seduced, intimidated, or provoked, don't I? Yeah. So now here's the rule. I can do whatever I want. I can see a psychologist and he'll say, well, what your problem is is that your thinking is wrong. You're thinking wrongly. And you go, oh, okay. And your thinking causes your feelings and they'll do what they call cognitive restructuring, right? I got trained in that sort of stuff. But <laughs> they'll, they'll, because they see the negative thinking as the problem. They see... My overreaction, they'd say that's a, that's a cognitive distortion. I'm seeing Joseph as a jerk, right? And they'll try and deal with that, right? But them trying to deal with that is dealing with the branches. Right, the externals. The, the root is the value. The, the root is the movement of my heart. That's... Yeah. Because and my heart is captivated, bound by this false value. That's why Swami Dayananda called it a binding desire. Can you see how the binding desire forms the context of my whole experience with you? Yes, yes. As you said, it determines uh, how... I think, how I feel, my physiology, my conduct, my response. Right. So if I'm trying sense. to change, mm -hmm. if these, you know, if, if my physiological reaction or my emotional hostility and that, or someone, some therapist, therapies will say, okay, what we've got to do is we've got to deal with the feelings. You know what I mean? You've got to get in touch with your feelings. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and, and so they take that approach because they, they think that's the big important thing, right? But again, they're fiddling around with an effect. They're not even touching the core, which is my active valuing love and approval in order to feel right about myself. Yeah, so it doesn't sound like they're going deep enough into the problem. No. And, and the psychosomatic schools, they deal with physiology. They say, okay, you know, work out your breathing and all that. And I'm not saying some of these don't, don't, don't modify it, but they don't deal with the issue, which is the valuing, the active valuing. And the behaviorists, of course, in Western psychology, They'll say, okay, what we've got to do is improve your social skills so that you can get the approval that you need so you'll feel happy. So they teach me, instead of being, me to being a crawler, they say, B, don't, don't crawl. What you need to do is um, uh, be a little bit more assertive, you know what I mean, but, but just you know, watch what you're doing and then, that, and then you'll get the approval that you like. Right? In a way that they could be teaching you the skills to chase your cravings, to they pursue your cravings. You that, that, they're, they're trying to make you a successful craver. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Good luck with which, that one. <laughs> which digs a hole. This is where Swami Dayananda is quite brilliant because if there's not a shift in the heart or the will or whatever you want to call it, right, this from the, the very center of me, just right here, the movement of valuing, the activity of value, it's the activity, it's a movement. When we talk about emotion, we mean what moves us, right? We're not talking about feelings, we're talking about emotion. E means out, to move. So this valuing is moving us, and it totally and utterly governs our life. 
Mm. Right? And it doesn't matter. So if, if we if we think, well, how do we change psychologically? Now, I read a book which had a profound influence on me. It was called The Value of Values by Swami Dayananda. Mm -hmm. And basically, the, prim, prim, the principle of this book was this. Unless we discover new values, right, there will be no change in us because there's no change in what's moving us. Yeah, right. And this is profound, you know, and if you're looking at counseling and stuff like that and you look at people, and you've done counseling, Joe, I know. So people who come to you and they've got sad memories, right? And, again, some schools of thought mean, okay, they've got to go back, relive them and all that stuff. Okay, okay. Now, again, they're upset about the sad memory. So they may have had experiences as a child of being rejected socially, right? And there's going to be various ways to try and deal with that, aren't there? You know, well, let's just talk about it and get it off your chest and all of that stuff. And I'm not saying, but what that is palliative. You know, when you do some palliation doesn't mean cure, right? Now, the so thing is... Even, um... Even positive affirmations, you know, trying to tell yourself that there's another way to look at it could yeah. be uh, the same sort of thing, right? It's palliative because if you sometimes it works because if you actually believe it, you'll hypnotically believe it, but it's not very stable because the thing is that if I have if I have a value of of feeling that my life and security depend upon the approval and love of other people. Right, which is, by the way, very common for us human beings. Mm. We might not like to admit it, but it's true. So, yeah. so what happens is, I I have had that desire to for love and approval because when I was only a little person, about three years old, I desperately needed the love and approval. I've still got the same desperation, but I have the adult form. And the adult form is the pretending that I don't. <laughs> You've added a new layer. <laughs> but but like what Freud said, that that intensity of demand that w I had when I was three, it exists in me as an adult. Mm. Right? And then you've got this whole lot of a background of experiences of getting the approval I wanted and not getting the approval. If, for example, I've managed to learn to play the social game well, so I mainly get the social approval, right, I will be a balanced, psychologically balanced human being. Yeah. But that's because I've, that learned, I've learned skills in such a way I can get the approval. Mm -hmm. Right? But if I haven't yeah. and I've got a whole background of failing at this, I've got all these hurtful memories, haven't I? And they are hurtful. By the way, given, given my value, I will have hurtful experiences. It's not my imagination. True. All right? Now, where, when it comes to counselling, what do you do? Do you have to deal with all of this past stuff, go into mental archaeology and get people to relive experiences and punch pillows and all that sort of crap? Right? No. You see, all of those similar experiences are locked and associated in my mind. Is that right? Yeah. Now, when I get into a similar situation today and I'm facing you and then you reject me, all of those accumulated memories come alive in me with a lot of intense force. Right? Yeah. Now. But can you imagine if that value ceases to be a value? Right? So let's say suddenly I'm no longer moved by the desire to be approved of or loved by other people. Right? It's not active in me. 
those memories still exist in my mind, but none of them will hurt me because the reason that they're hurtful experiences is because right here, right now, I'm actively desiring to be liked and admired or approved of. And when I look at the painful memories, it hurts because I still, that's bubbling. Do you see how, do you see how what we value, what we crave, what we value and what we crave, determines is the is the context that forms the context of my life and context determines meaning for example have you seen if i said to you the man grabbed the person and cut their belly open with a knife does that sound bad certainly does but what if it's a young surgeon under enemy fire doing it. Oh, that's okay. The whole meaning changes. Yeah. Now, what I want to get here is this. We, in order to understand Dianander's psychology, particularly because we need to understand that this act of valuing, this inordinate need for have certain types of experiences, determines us, governs us, and forms the context that, and the meanings that we'll give to life, to our everyday experiences. So I'm, I'm having, you're, you're being nice to me, I'm saying Joe's a nice person. So that meaning, he's a nice person, life's going pretty good, I'm a nice guy now because I'm being approved of. Obviously, I've got some value. Do you know what I mean? You're getting there. You're getting there, Pete. I'm getting, oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm finally getting I'm I've changed. I'm getting there. Because someone has taught me how to present socially well. Self-help programs working B. Yeah, the B project is yay. All right. So 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 the value that's active in me right here, right now, as I am, is what is determining my way of being in the world. My way of being in the world. The only thing that will shift us to let us go beyond the various ways of being in the world that we seem to be fixed in is a shift in valuing. There has to be a shift in the heart, which also means a shift in the understanding, because with my understanding, I might discover a new value, mightn't I? Well, hopefully. Mm. Yeah. We're gonna go, we're gonna go into that, but but what I wanted to uh, really get the the, the thorough point. When Dayananda said that, you know, the psychology of the Gita is the psychology of desire, I got very excited because I like psychodynamic thinking. I like the Freudian school with it because it, it looks at what we're moved by. Now, they, of course, theoretically thought, okay, we've got to change the dynamics of the individual, right? But so, but the problem is that we might now feel, ah, the, the problem is, is that I'm, I'm, I'm self-dissatisfied. But why am I self-dissatisfied? Why is it? Why is it that there's no, that at the core of my being, there's no fullness? Why is that? Because, because there's deficiency, there's no fullness, right? That so the so the self dissatisfaction is also there's something we're unconscious of that is lies behind the self dissatisfaction. Does that make sense? Right. So it's not just because you're not. It's not just hating getting myself. what you want. You're saying there's something deeper. It's something deeper. Yeah. And this is where we get to the religious point. When I said to you that 
Swami Dayananda's psychology is a God-centered psychology. You see, for the Hindus, they use three Sanskrit words, Sat, Chit, Ananda. Now, when I talk about that, I change it to the English vernacular, life, light, and fullness. So they would say that real life is the life, light, and fullness that is God. The life, light, and fullness that is God. And Dhananda would point out that occasionally in our life, we have these moments where suddenly, for no reason whatsoever, we just seem to be alive. Do you mean we're just we're just being? We just have moments where we're just simply being, and at the same time, we're being aware, and at the same time, we're being full. Mm -hmm. He he says that sometimes we find our slot, right? Okay. Now, what's important is this, is that for Swami Dayananda, we can never, we can only be at home with ourselves when we're at home with God. Okay? Mm -hmm. We can only, we need to discover what it means to be at home in God. Not in home with by myself, but in God. And he called this resting in the lap of Ishvara. Now, what, why this is important is that, like I said last time, we've got all these clinical categories in Western psychology. We've got hostility, we've got anxiety, we've got grief, we've got all various things. We've got narcissism, we've got character disorders, all of these various things. But for Swami Dayananda, he had one term, Self-dissatisfaction. So it didn't matter what we're dissatisfied with. The universal thing was I have a self-dissatisfaction centered on me. I hate being what I'm like. Right. So do I need to see that? Absolutely. If I, yeah, if I don't if I don't realize, if I don't come to the understanding that uh, there's, a, there's a teacher who emphasized this, Swamini Atma Prakashananda, that people and things don't hurt you, they're only instrumental in revealing a pain that's already there. Right? So, right. So what's happening is my everyday life can become a revelation, a very necessary revelation of this fundamental self-hatred that I have. You know that people's desire. You know when you know when people attack others and hate others. Well, that's actually yeah. projected self hatred. <laughs> if you want to see what they really feel about themselves, that's what you're looking at. They just turned it out. So that's like the teaching at uh, when they used to do school counselling that children who are often bullies have been bullied. Yeah. And then externalizing that same experience. Because if you have, for example, a person who's been bullied, they feel that they're a victim of the being the bullying, right? If you remember, if you imagine when you're a little kid and you're watching the TV, you wanted to be the Lone Ranger, didn't you? Because being the Lone Ranger, he was the winner. Yeah, there are lots of heroes in young childhood when you're watching TV. Right. So... <laughs> If you're abused by an abusive parent, when you become the parent, the winner, you cut off the feeling of pain. So you compulsively become a hurter. But it always boils right. down to self-hatred. Okay. So once we understand that the location of the problem is us, Swami Dayananda says, you are the problem, you are the solution. He meant the location of the problem of human beings is not external. It seems to be external. It seems that you have made me upset, Joe. Right? Yeah. Now, what's the, what, why, why is this so important? Because, but if I, if I right here, right now, as I am, 
discover how to be at home with myself, to be at home, home in God. I'm at home with myself because I'm in at home in God. Right? Because the fundamental problem of a human being is that we think that we are separate and apart from this life, light, and fullness. That's the fundamental principle in Vedanta. That it's only as though we're separate and apart. It doesn't actually, the separation doesn't exist in fact. It just seems to be that way. So our problem, and this is very important when it comes to one of the problems with Christian theology is that there is an idea that original sin, that you are basically bad. Dianana didn't thought that was a very destructive theological idea. Because if you, if your in, innate nature is bad, he said, if that was reality, you could do nothing about it. Sure. Yeah. So You're stuck with it. basically we're suffering from a dream thinking that we have life separate and apart from God. That is the basis of the self-dissatisfaction. That's a problem. In our Western scriptures, they mm -hmm. describe human beings as, as withering branches cut off from the life of the vine. So the idea that you can be happy, that you can achieve happiness through external things is actually a fallacy that unless you can come into relationship with this life, light, and fullness, uh, there is no chance of genuine happiness. And when he talked about resting in the lap of Ishvara, he wasn't thinking about God. He was thinking of, of a, way in be, a way of being in which you are in yourself without any form of resistance, without any form of conflict, no disturbance, no fighting. They, so another, complete neutrality? Would you call it a complete neutrality? Well, or not quite. Neutral? Well, with it, with it, he talks about in, in the Bhagavad Gita a thing called graceful acceptance. Mm -hmm. And he says that this graceful acceptance is born out of the understanding of Ishvara. Okay, but you're not you're not suggesting that we don't have feelings or thoughts. Absolutely right? not. Yeah. Well, I, he's very sane on that too. Because but I don't want to go into this right now, but what okay. I'm saying is that if I can come to a way of being in the world in which I'm at home with myself, what happens to all of the different forms of self-dissatisfaction? Disappear. Or they disappear. That's Resolve. right. Right? So the whole point is this, is that Human beings are enclosed in valuing, loving themselves and loving the world. Loving their egos, loving myself as separate and apart from God. I love me. Me, I, myself, and be. And, and concerned and, and thinking about that, preoccupied with that love. How am I doing? Am I doing all right? No, no, I'm not. No, that wasn't good. Egocentric, centered on self. Right? And also craving for things in the world. It almost forces us to be two different people. One one that sees the problem, the other one that has to one that manifests the problem, the other one that has to then deal with it. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we are going to go into that. But okay. But at the moment we're looking at the disease. What I want to know is it is it clear to you that the, re the big fundamental question, why is it that we can't change? Mm. The, the reason is, is that we always try to change externals or we try and change ourselves. I'm going to change my thinking. I'm going to change my feelings. Uh -uh. If there's no change in the heart, in what you love, you're going to fail if there's no change. Mm. So unless 
there's a discovery of what is truly good, not what seems to be good. But unless I discover what is truly good, in other words, I discover a new value and that value becomes valuable to me. And when it becomes valuable to me, I get moved by that new value, which is tr a value that's true and real. There is no change in me. There can't be. So what we're looking at here is that unless I discover what is truly good, so something new moves me, I'm going to be condemned, I'm going to be enclosed in ways of thinking, in ways of feeling, in, in ways of physiology, and in ways of conduct. I'll be enclosed in those things, locked in. And my whole life becomes a repetition compulsion, as Dr. Freud talked about. So th that's mainly all I wanted to talk about tonight, really, was this, this thing that can you see that when people, if people have uh, cravings to do with their self-preoccupation with them, their love of themselves, or they're loving external things of the world, thinking that it's going to provide happiness and security. In other words, they become what Dianander calls emotionally dependent on the world. So suddenly the world becomes this thing that gives them happiness or takes it away. If that's the case, for the rest of my life, I'm going to be a victim. Yeah, you're creating a dependence either on yourself or on the world, right? Yes. Hmm. And, and that they're essentially uh, um, things that are not dependable, are they? No, because they're temporary. Oh. The, the Buddhists have this notion that the world, uh, samsaric life, is like a big wheel, right? It's like a big wheel. The thing is that and we, there's nothing in us that remains the same. It's undergoing constant change. The wheel is always turning. So I might get acceptance today and then not tomorrow. I might have health today, but not tomorrow. It continually turns around. Also, and this is very important, we get lost in the wheel. If I'm suddenly angry at you and all of this stuff, I'm actually moving along with the movement, aren't I? Yeah. I'm being a material movement. I'm beat. My life and being is a material movement. There's nothing spiritual in that. But if I can, while I'm in this life, be rooted in freedom, being rooted in God, which is the same thing, the thing, the wheel will keep turning. Feelings and, and, and thoughts are going to keep coming and going. But I'm no longer lost in the turning wheel, am I? No. So what this means is there's a possibility of appreciating a freedom that is not contingent or dependent upon what's happening in front of me. Uh -huh. And it's very helpful to, to see that you at any one moment you're always facing what's happening in front of you. You're facing the movement of the universe in front of you. You're facing... What people are saying and doing, you're facing what conditions are like, and believe it or not, you're also facing thoughts and feelings. That's one of Swami Dayananda's wonderful teachings, which changed my life. I used to think my thoughts and feelings was my own. Right? Yeah. They were inside me. There were thoughts and feelings inside me, and outside me were movements of what people were doing and conditions. But what Swami Dayananda points out is that we're always looking at this functioning of the laws in front of us. And it's, and it's part of, so the very thoughts and feelings that I have are also part of this intelligent arrangement of this universe. Right? So the thing is that, so it's a question of whether I get lost in, obsessed about the universe, obsessed with hating it, fearing it, or craving it. Or I can achieve a freedom where I'm, facing it, but I'm no longer lost in it. I'm no longer caught up in the movement of it. 
Do you see what I mean? Yeah, right. So it's, it's like stepping back, isn't it, in a way? Does it feel, feel like that? Uh, not quite, because it's not like... It's a sense of life and being that comes from the life, light, and fullness that is God, as opposed to a life and being that comes from my craving, my self-love and love of the world. I thought of stepping back in the sense of I see that that's happening. I see that that's what's actually going on. Yeah, yeah, that that's right. If I, well, again, it's not so much... When I understand what it means to be able to be relaxed in the lap of Ishvara, that that is always a, a possibility that exists for me right here, right now, as I am, right? Then it it's it's a shift. It's instead of being located in the world of change and movement and temporality, you're now rooted in being. More like that. Yeah. Now, of course, as I said before, you have those moments where you find yourself be just simply being yourself, being aware and being full. And when you're like that, you're distinct from the movements. The movements are happening, but you're not moving along with it. You're not you're not a movement anymore. You don't get drawn into it. You're not craving it. Not desiring it. Well, you're not craving not it, draw, it. Craving it. Craving in it draws you into it. Right. See, so Swami Dayananda said that the whole preparation for the psychology of the Gita is to bring about two things. One is the neutralization of binding desires. That's the whole game. And what he said was that when a, a desire is neutralized. What happens is it's a, like a snake without fangs when a desire is neutralized. It doesn't, mm -hmm. the desire doesn't go away, but it's, you're no longer being determined. It's not, the desire is no longer determining how you see and how you act. Right? And then he's, so there's two things with the, with the psychology of the Gita that he unfolded. The purpose is to bring about a neutralization of the binding desires so you're no longer riveted on the world, mentally preoccupied with yourself and the world. So in other words, your mind is released from the binding nature of desires. Okay? That, that keeps your attention out. But then he says, and the second reason is to bring about the discovery of a contemplative disposition. Now, this is very, very important because this is what we mean by that this is the basis where after you see he said that what we need to do is we need to appreciate freedom in its relative form before we can appreciate it in its absolute form because okay, yeah. we the life light and fullness that is god is freedom in absolute in ab, it's not a form it's absolute me not me being able to remain the same, no matter whether you're positive or negative to me, Joe, right? That's relative freedom. But right. It's but, a degree of freedom. Right. But Vedanta proper is all about this journey without a distance into the depth of being. And this is why this whole contemplative disposition, being able to come back to your, the very life and being you are and appreciating that life and being as Satchitananda or, or life, light and fullness and being able to abide in that and live that as your life is what Vedanta is all about. But if I don't neutralize the binding desires, I won't be interested in that because it doesn't satisfy me. So neutralizing the the binding desires doesn't mean not having the desires, right? No. You're you're talking now about not going after them. 
the difference between there's a difference between having a desire and being the desire. Right. Often we're the desire. I want, I want, I want, I want. So having it having we're not get we're not he was not into getting rid of thoughts. Right, yeah. So but that but we must bear in mind that the whole purpose of the psychology of the Gita is to bring about to release you from this obsessive craving for external things because that takes you away from the life and being that's actually here that's available for recognition and appreciation right and then we can start to appreciate that life and being which is called being contemplative we start we start to find that we, we have what he calls a contemplative disposition. In other words, we start to have a, a disposition towards just simply being while we're living, which is this being free while we're living. So we're looking at relative freedom first because he says that we need to be able to appreciate what relative freedom is first before we can appreciate freedom in its absolute, absolute freedom. Absolute freedom is not some little thing that develops in me. The life, light, and fullness that is God is freedom. When we are appreciating God as our very life, we're no longer, we're appreciating uh, God in a non-dual way, aren't we? And that's the whole purpose of Vedanta. Yeah, right. That's often contrary to an, an ordinary thinking person, that freedom relies on on my orientation to God. Yeah, it does, ultimately. And what we're going to mm -hmm. talk about next time we get together is what it means to be free in terms of conduct, what it means to be free in terms of cognition and what it means to be free in terms of what we love, our heart. Okay. And But I just wanted to go over today to really bang home this point that while we're bound, unless we learn the approach to life that will release us from binding desires, no matter what we study, no matter what we read, no matter what we do, there's going to be no change in our life. Yeah, so the binding desires are, uh, are really the, one of the main features of our confused life. Yes, they are, the, they are literally the organizing principle of our life, yes. Hmm. Okay, and that's what we need release from. That takes some. That takes a challenge to see that, doesn't it? We don't want again, like we said last time, this problem that we have of of of, of self hatred, which we see manifest when people rubbish other people. You know when they you know when they're very angry and about how they're so critical yeah. of other people. If oh, you sure. see that. That is a manifestation of the degree of hatred they have for themselves. Then you'll get some idea, and this self-hatred is unconscious. And because it's unconscious, we never get near it. And what we're going to, and that's what we're going to go into this, into as we do these talks. We need to arrive at the place truthfully in what our actual condition is at this moment at this time i'm feeling yuck fantastic and that the problem is is me not the external world this is the beginning of emotional maturity yeah that's quite a shift yeah yeah all right joe great thanks b that's all right i'll see you next week okay Oh, actually, to it. I'm going to New Zealand. I'll see you in about about two or three weeks. Okay. Okay. Oh, bye bye. That's even better. Yeah. Bye. Yeah.